Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer Kickstarter board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is a cooperative dungeon crawler. It's a steampunk game for one to four players. It takes about 60 to 90 minutes, I'm guessing per scenario, and it's called Machina Arcana by Jurei Birich. And I hope I said that even sort of right, and if not, I apologize. Uh, and of course, it's got all the steampunk stylings to it and a ton of components. As you probably know about certain dungeon crawlers, it's a group or party of players, or even by yourself, you're going to venture into these catacombs or these dungeons or these like post apocalyptic settings, depending on the story. And you're going to try and defeat monsters, you're going to try and solve puzzles, you're going to try and complete scenarios, and it is no different in this one. However, However, it has a steampunk feel to it, and it is also in inclusion of the HP Lovecraft mythos for the Cthulian horror style game. You're going to be fighting different horror monsters like the Cthune and the Bufoff and the Sorol, and of course the other type. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of Cthulian mythos type monsters in here. And if not, they kind of it's kind of gleamed from the same mythos, right? Uh, including the steampunk feel. You're going to choose of one to four, one of the four different characters, and then you and up to three friends are going to go on an adventure. I have scenario one here, which I'll be talking to you about and showing you a little bit about. I don't want to spoil too much, but the idea is you're going to try and collect different scenario goals, equipment, fighting monsters, and dealing with problems along the way, all as well using traps and tricks to try and defeat monsters. If you die, you actually become a monster yourself, and you are now a sentient being trying to help destroy the party members who could not keep you alive, and so you must have them join you in death. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the game. So here we have Machina Arcana and all its glory. Of course, it comes with a box and this rule book. It's really well done specifically for a prototype. And it has a bunch of, of course, different illustrations and whatnot that tell you how the game is played, as well as all the different actions and whatnot. Uh, this is everything you're going to get. And I'll try and go through as much as I can in a timely manner. There is player boards here. You can choose from one of the different four player boards with each of the different characters having their own unique spot down there. Each of the characters have their own a specific uh, menu melee and uh, mental or arcane ability. They have their health, they have their actions, and then of course how many essence they can have. You're going to go ahead and move your uh, actions to whatever how many actions it says you can have, as well as your health tracker, depending on the different characters will have different health, and of course they'll have their own unique abilities as well. It's going to come with a character standy for each character, and then you're going to take three of your specific uh, types of these little things here for your lasting effects and put it up here to just illustrate lasting effects that may occur throughout the game. Over here are a bunch of tokens you've got the entrance tiles where you're going to start in certain areas. These are uh, specifically for lit li lighting scenarios and these are when you perform an action on a space you just place them on top. You've got door tokens you've got additional health and whatnot as well as horror tokens. Over here you're going to have boards, the different scenario boards and of course the scenario one ending board. This is kind of a hidden board which you don't look at. You're going to take one of these uh, four tiles here at random for this scenario and then put it has of course a front and a back which is really cool and you're going to then place a uh, an entrance tile pr provided it tells you to do that. So what it's going to happen is at the beginning of the game you make sure all this is set up as well. Um, and you've got your, your this is your threat tracker, you've got your uh, horror, sp horror spawn over here, your monster spawn over here, and then your monster spawn slider, which will illustrate the different monsters in the game. And uh, your starting thing will be here, basically for this specific one, as you draw the new scenario cards, it tells you here, place a uh, entry token down, and then it also, as you illustrate how, what uh, numbers you're to put these guys on, which I'll get into in the gameplay se section of it. But uh, just for the beginning intro, so you understand how it all puts, puts together. You've got your standees over here, these are all your monsters. This is your monster deck. And these are all the equipment decks for each of the different heroes. It tells you in the book which heroes get which decks. And then you have the uh, horror deck over or horror deck over here. And this is another deck for exploration and whatnot. Uh, each deck is actually going to come with different uh, numbers on them, uh, illustrating different cards, so that when you start the game, you're going to have ones in, and as the scenario progresses, you're going to add new cards to the deck, and monsters will start at one, and of course progress to four, which is illustrated on this tracker here as this pushes through. As this goes across, this tracker is going to move, and as this tracker moves, you're going to put more monsters in the deck, making the game more and more difficult. Your objective, of course, is to complete the scenario and get to the last card. And on the board here is a bunch of different things that you want to look out for and so you understand what's going to be on there. Yeah, like exploding barrels here. You've got chests. You've got a workbench. You've got these 
these trap tiles and of course the ability to uh, trigger the traps as well on these gears. Monsters, spawners, you've got rubble, you've got the, these, these little cracks in the floor that are like basically empty holes that can take, that can, that can kill, hurt you really badly. And um, then you've got scenario markers which are somewhere on the board over here, right here. And when you trigger that, that's when it's going to get, let you go to the next card. Now certain cards require you to do certain things in order to do that as well, but as you progress the game it's going to work like that. Uh, these are also working the same way as you progress through the scenarios. You will include the second and then third of the different weapons and the different clothing and whatnot. And uh, as well as these decks here, you're going to be putting in the ones and if it tells you to put in other ones. These are the dice in the game. You've got uh, the white dice and the black die and based on the attacks, it'll tell you which die to roll. This is for your horror and your monster spawner. You're going to roll this and determine if you have to spawn monsters or draw horror cards. And then uh, this one here is like a reset thing that you can choose to use as an action. That's pretty much what you're going to be getting. I imagine there's probably a bunch more scenarios you can, you can get in the campaign and whatnot. But this is what I have to show you. So I'll come up and talk to you about how the game is played as well as what you can do on your turn. So after you went ahead and set up the board, I showed you pretty much the entire setup for the game. You're then going to put all your dudes next to the starting sp space, depending on what scenario. It's going to be different for all the different scenarios, I imagine. But when you place guys down, you put them on the scenario space, or the starting space. And then if they're filled up, if you play with more than two players, you just put them adjacent. And that's how it works for all spawning. You try and put it as close as possible to the players or to the spaces as you can. And then if you can't, you have to outreach as close as you possibly can. After you do that, then players are going to take in turn order all their actions. Usually it's going to be six different actions or six action points. And there is a gajillion different actions in this game, so I'm not going to explain them all. You have to look it up yourself. But I'll give you a couple. Move, attack, activate a space, uh, utilize, utilize traps, uh, you can gain chests. You can light certain things. I mean, there's 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 a whole bunch. There's a ton. In fact, I had to write it all down on a piece of paper. So I definitely suggest adding a little card that shows you all the different things you can do. Most of them you're not going to do very often, but they can give you certain things like essence and whatnot, and it's hard to remember that kind of stuff. Nevertheless, uh, after you've gone ahead and used all your actions, the next player is going to get to use their actions and so on and so forth until all the players are done using their actions, just like a normal dungeon crawler. And then you're going to actually roll a die for each player to see if monsters spawn. If they do, they spawn on the monster space that is closer to that specific player. And uh, then after all the monsters have spawned, you're going to go on to the horror phase. One player will roll for the entire round. If it rolls a higher die number than the horror requirement, you will draw a horror card and do whatever it says. Usually they're bad and bad is bad. And also you'll move the tracker along for the threat to progressively increase the difficulty of the monsters coming out. After that occurs, then uh, you're going to have all the monsters move. And the monsters are basically like derpy guys. They don't know what they're doing. They just move as close as they can to you. And then they, they use their ability. If they can't use their ability, they move. And if they don't need to move because they're close enough to you to use their ability, they'll use their ability. Some monsters won't move and do specific actions. Some monsters specifically will do like charges and whatnot, but they're all very simplistic in nature. They are basically nasty AIs that come and try and mess with you while you're trying to complete the different scenarios and whatnot. After they are done, you go out back to the next round and continue. Of course, the game gets more difficult as you progress through the rounds because the trackers move up. And as the scenarios change, the dice requirements are going to change as well. And usually it's going to be for the negative for you, more likely to spawn monsters, more likely to spawn horror cards. And you're trying to get to this specific end scenario tile. Now, I'm not going to show you most of these boards here because I don't want to ruin things, but it looks really cool. And it has some really cool aspects to the end game that I think you'd find interesting for a dungeon crawler. Nevertheless, that is a basic idea of the game crawling through the depths of a steampunk horror game with Cthulian style monsters let's go ahead and show you basically how a round is played back to Machina Arcana and as you can see we're setting up and ready to play the game we're just going to take this scenario one which is called horror in the ice it has nothing in the back it just symbolizes the chapter and for the first scenario we're going to reveal it and see what it says well it says the entrance and it has a lot of flavor text that explains what's going on and then it tells you what you need to do it says seven over here on this track and then it says four over here on this track and then it says place the entry token down the entry token is going to be like located on these little uh these little diamond areas here on each of the different boards it's going to have one and you're supposed to orientate it so that it's down here just like this basically showing that the players are coming in take one of these entrance tiles here place it just like that and then you're going to put your characters down now they have to at least be uh, two on here and if you're playing a four player game obviously you can put that like just like that the closest you can you can't go through walls or, and there's walls throughout the game here all the characters and boards are set up so they all have their own unique health they've got their actions and of course their essence which all starts at zero and you're going to be needing to use that for things like uh, monster spawners getting
being blocked and potentially even to seal, uh, to go through the next chapter tiles. Okay, so we're now ready to begin. So the first thing we need to do is uh, take care of this chapter tile, right? And every player is going to choose to uh, take a turn. So the first player can choose to go. It's going to be one, two, and then three. He moves three for three actions, and you're going to go ahead and uh, move these down. And then he can choose to for three more actions to open a chest. When you open a chest, you're going to take a card from the deck. Oh, these guys are all shown face up, but you choose to take a uh, take card from the deck of your specific type. For this character, it's going to be obviously the weapons. And these twos and threes are not in yet, so we take one of these. And then he can choose any other deck he wants, one of the top cards. So we'll just take this one here. I'll move these decks to the bottom, I suppose. But uh, you get the idea. After you've taken one of each of the different types, uh, then you can go ahead and look at them and see what they are. We have a uh, Cicatrazer, which basically is an attack based on range. And then this one here is a teleport within one space. Ooh, I like this one. So we'll take this one here. This character will get it. And then this card here is the one that would get discarded from the game. Uh, after that, that's all of his actions, so the next player can choose to go. One, two, three. Now, he can't go this way because he's got Rebel, so maybe he want to go one, two, three, uh, four, five, and six. And then the next player over here, he can go, she can go one and two. Uh, then you have this thing here, which is basically a spawner. Now, spawners are basically the things that spawn monsters uh, closest to you. Uh, if a monster spawned on her turn, it would be right here. You can try and seal these, but you need essence. It requires essence and actions, and she doesn't have any currently, so she'd have to keep moving, unfortunately four, five, and six. And then of course, when whenever you use your actions, obviously go ahead and reduce them down to zero so that you do not forget that you used all of your actions. And this guy finally, he can go one and two, and then he can use the rest of his actions to open, uh, to basically do an event. And this is one of the event cards here. It has a bunch of flavor text as well. And then it says something really interesting. Reduce the roll, uh, monster's attack roll by one. So you would place that down. And until another card gets put on top of this one, all monster attack rolls are reduced by one. That's pretty awesome, right? Now, every single character has utilized all of their actions. And so you're going to move on to the next phase of the uh, game, which is going to be the monster spawning phase. And it's pretty simple. You'll take this D10 here. You're going to roll the D10 for each player. And you're going to check to see if it spawns. If it spawns, um, if you roll higher than or equal to the number required, you'll spawn a monster. And that's seven or eight, nine or ten. We rolled a one, so that's not going to work for him. Then we'll go to him. That's a ten. Zero is a ten, so it would spawn a monster. You'll take the, one of the monsters from the one deck, reveal it. Then you'll take one of these standees here based on the monster, and you will place it down on the closest monster spawning space to that specific player. In this instance, it would probably be oh, right here, most likely. And then, of course, the next person is going to go ahead and roll and check. That's a three. And then finally, another 10 for uh, her. So, oh, no, uh, she's going to get a monster as well. We'll flip over another one by Potheod. And you're going to find them on here. I'm just going to pick a random one. But there are all the different types of monster standees that you can go ahead and look through and pick and put down. After you've gone ahead and done that, one player will roll the horror die, and you want to get uh, lower than a four, but that's going to be difficult. Uh, oops, I didn't get that there. Uh, we got a one, so we did get lower than a four, so we're not going to draw it. Now, if we did draw it, if we did get higher than a four or a four, we'd reveal this. There's a flavor text, and then it would say something. This one says increase the monster's attack roll by one, so that would actually cancel these guys out. And if it also did succeed, this threat level would go up. If this threat level goes all the way across, it'll go back down and move this here, which would then bring us the next deck of well, the next deck of monsters. There's a, two monsters, and you put them in and shuffle them in. Uh, and you would continue that way. That's the basic aspect of a turn, play a whole round, and that players are then going to rinse and repeat that. Oh, except monsters will attack. I almost forgot about that. Monsters will actually attack. If they cannot reach you, they will move as close as they possibly can to you. And if they are in within range, they will attack you. Um, so you have this guy over here. He's actually not able to move, it specifically says. And it also says, for an action, if a wounded monster exists, restore health to that monster. Otherwise, arcane attack and explore, but you have to be within range. And he's immobile, so he actually cannot move. So if he's not within range, he won't attack. This one over here says he doesn't do an, he does do an attack if he is within range. And it is a, uh, two actions, and he's got five. And then it's if he's within range, uh, so he'll move up one. And then he'll attack the closest player with a black and a white die. He would roll these here, and uh, he got a three. Then you would compare this to the armor of the player, and if it is equal or higher, it is going to hit. So we look at her armor, which is two, so it does hit. It would reduce her attack down, and he would once again roll, and one more hit. That's nasty. 
Um, and he has another ability which says he can move two spaces, and when this monster is hit, he moves two spaces towards the spawn space, so he can run away. All of the monsters also have their own unique flavor text. This one says, it seemed at first, it seemed like he was shy at first, but we slowly learned that he had other intentions, which is kind of cool. I like all the different um, all the different flavor text. But then after that, that's when the round would be over, and players would then all refresh their, uh, their actions so that they can uh, come back and start doing some more stuff. And the monsters will need to be destroyed. You actually fight them the same way and they also have their uh, HP as well um, and they stay on the board until they are removed. You gain certain other things throughout the game as you're moving along and obviously you're trying to get to these spaces here so you can open up the next scenario. If you did that you would open up the next scenario and whenever you actually utilize a space you're going to put these things on them saying that you, you utilize them in some way. Um, but whenever you finish that up, you go to the next scenario basically, and it has this kind of legacy feel to it, where it's like, okay, you have to stop here now, uh, and now you can sacrifice a health to move up to three spaces. Once you sacrifice four health, you can move on to the next chapter, provided you, uh, do the uh, chapter space again. And then of course, each player, uh, moves up to two spaces. Uh, and you read the, the text, once you finish that one, you'll continue and go on. And there's always going to be different requirements and changes to the, uh, role values required for each of these different chapters. So this one here says seven. And this one here says four, and the next one here might be different. This one here says six and five. You get the idea. And uh, that's the basic idea of the game, fighting the monsters. Of course, there's a lot more to it, but I just want to give you the basic interesting aspects. Uh, so it'll tell us to add items level two, so we take all these guys and add them to these decks here. So that way the players can gain better and new items as the game progresses. But once you get to that final fight, you're going to be fighting against the scenario one end tile and perhaps even a boss or something. And uh, yeah, that's the idea of the game Machina Arcane. All right, let's come up and talk about it. So a couple caveats before we get into it. The first thing is that this game actually has a little bit of a side-scrolling mechanic too. And you have a two by two grid that you can have, and if you need to move farther than that, you'll remove the other tiles and kill all the monsters. However, if there's a player on that tile, you can't do that, but you're going to need to because the chapter tiles or scenarios are gonna require you to move to different spaces and whatnot. It'll tell you on the cards when you need to move to a different uh, tile and how it needs to happen, and eventually get to that scenario one end tile. So it has an interesting maneuverability throughout the game and there's a ton of actions like I said I I, I cannot list all the different ones because there's so many different things most of them are all kind of similar in ways but they have differences and they're going to give you essences and whatnot and those are all really really important aspects to the game uh, so what do I think about it well first of all the artwork is super good if you like steampunk if you like Cthulhu and mythos put together it has a great feel to it this game reminds me a lot of descent it has the different feel it has the different like feelings uh, uh, that I had when I was playing Descent. I enjoyed the dungeon crawly aspect. I know I only have one scenario, so I imagine they are all different in their own unique way. The characters feel different enough. Most of them are very similar, but with, they have the abilities like this guy here. He's the, she's, he's a healer, or she's a healer, and she can restore health and explore if you use an essence. Uh, this one over here has got some interesting stuff. When you kill, you may equip one item for one stamina. Uh, all the different horror cards are nasty, and they all have their own flavor text. In fact, flavor text in this game is probably one of the best things about it because of how the uh, how much you get in it and how you do feel the story coming across, which is super cool. I love that aspect. The, all the different scenario cards give it to you, all the different event cards give it to you, the horror cards give it to you, and even the monsters come with their own unique feel. And all of the flavor text fits with how the monsters act in their own unique ways, right? Like the, the tree that doesn't move the heal stuff, it says, such a sacred place, this land of nightmares, which is basically a tree that constantly heals and is immobile. And the monsters get progressively more difficult, just like the game does, which kind of makes it nice because you can uh, add this mechanism to every single different scenario and it functions the same way so you have to learn different aspects of different scenarios and you got some super scary monsters throughout the game this guy here is an Asagawa and it has wow it has roll five dice and uh also push two two spaces when a monster is hit when any monster is hit this monster pushes an attacker a space oh man it, and then <laughs> attacks uh, attack three dead black explorers that didn't move on a push so it it's got some strong stuff and of course it's still the the flavor text that is there all the standees are nice. I don't know if it's going to be a standee game or a miniature game, but I don't think the miniatures are even needed based on how nice the standees are. If you have the option to go with miniatures, it's a dungeon crawler, so it would probably be nice. But if not, no big deal either way. Uh, I enjoyed the scenario. It, it, it was... I mean, like any dungeon crawl, I feel it's a little samey as far as how scenarios go. You're going to go through things, you're going to activate different things, and you're going to... Uh, 
finish the scenario off. And of course, as you go through the different cards, different things will happen, uh, but you're doing the same stuff, right? You're spawning monsters, you're dealing with them, you're doing these scenario event spaces, you are opening chests, you're opening event cards, uh, you're going to workshops, avoiding exploding barrels, but there are a couple unique aspects. There are traps that can trigger, and if you die, you turn into a monster as well. When you die, at, when you die as a player, you become basically a sentient monster, and you can kind of utilize certain things that other monsters can't, destroying doors, triggering traps on other players, all that good stuff. So you're no longer just this, the AI is no longer just a blobbering mass. It's also it's the players that you didn't help well enough to to you know get through the game. They are now trying to stop you from finishing the scenario, which gives players something to do without having to constantly do this respawn mechanic. So it does function in a different way uh, other than descent, and each scenario can be played independently on its own as far as i'm aware i don't think it's i don't know if it's a campaign or not but i guess you could play them from one two three and four and so on and so forth all of the item cards get progressively stronger all of the different scenarios get progressively more intense and interesting like i said if you like stories and you like the feel of a game that's thick with theme and you like the Cthulian steampunk mythos, as well as the dungeon crawl, you're going to enjoy this game. It has a bit of luck as far as die rolling is concerned, because you're rolling these guys, but you can make changes based on the item cards that you have with you. Um, if you enjoy other types of dungeon crawlers, this is going to be one for you. If you don't like the game, because it's, it's a bit long for, you know, for any normal board game, but dungeon crawlers tend to be that way. Um, most people here who've seen this understand kind of what it's going to be. So if you're interested, go ahead and check out in the description below. As for me, I personally do enjoy Dungeon Crawlers quite a bit. And this theme is what really set me over the over the top with it. I was like, oh, you know, it's cool. But then with the theme and the flavor text is what was like, yes, I really, really do feel like this game is something interesting and unique. And I want to see the other scenarios. If you're interested, do go ahead and check it out. But that's what I got to say. All right, guys. Thanks for watching the Unfiltered Gamer Kickstarter board game review. If you're interested in taking a look at Machina Arcana, go ahead and do so in the description below. It'll be currently on Kickstarter on the 4th, so hopefully you're seeing this in time to pat back it if you're interested. It's a game for people who enjoy dungeon crawlers and the specific theme, and it has some unique aspects as well. Also, go ahead and check out our website, unfilteredgamer.com. Tons of blog posts, giveaways, Kickstarter lists, and more, as well as checking out our friends at The Giveaway Geek and at Kess. Two great stuff there. They have uh, giveaways and the one that's got uh, different games and whatnot. Go ahead and check them out. Anyway, that's all I got for this one. And as always, I look forward to exploring a steampunk style Cthulian horror dungeon with you next time.